take us to the beginning of the conversation we are having. Where did we start our local government journey from? What inspiration gave us our current local government system? Thank you very much. If you look at the, the local government system, after the TNDC mm -hmm. came to power on the 31st of December, 1981, it was the whole idea was, you know, power to the people. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, we were to ensure that the people on the ground really were the ones who make decisions, who would ensure that they participate in governance. So the PNDC, Power to the People, saw uh, PDCs and uh, PWD, PWDs all being set up. Okay. at workplaces and in the communities. Uh -huh. And people took control of the communities to do things that ordinarily they were not doing. So arising out of that, the whole idea was how you can decentralize the public administration effectively to now have local governance okay. by the people themselves. Mm -hmm. And they will have powers similar to many other jurisdictions but this time round they will have the basic deliberative administrative and executive powers at the level of the district now through this the pndc set up committees okay paddock is one of them What's public, paddock? Admi public administration and, res and researching and then decentralization of the public system. Okay. So this was done, and therefore, arising out of that, there was a need also to set up a committee and to look at how will this power to the people be translated into policy okay. that would eventually manifest in legislation. So that was governance from the bottom? From the bottom. Okay. And that is how the whole idea was leading to the Blue Book and the Assembly elections in 1988. What's the Blue Book? The Blue Book was the um, policy document that outlined how the communities, based on the existing districts at the time, how they were to govern people, how people were to be elected to these places. And through that, PNDC Law 207 was passed. Okay. And, and that gave the idea of decentralized system based on the power to the people concept. Mm -hmm. And which ordinary people, by the formula, were to be elected. And then they will have presiding members and the secretaries at that time. You know. So basically, with this concept, was the idea that power and decision making in terms of municipal services, things that ordinary people should be doing, and not the major items of central government activity, will be exercised by the people. They were to make bylaws, they were to ensure that the environment was well kept. In line with all, almost all local governance uh, systems in the world, but this time the server was for ordinary people, not people with higher level qualifications and all that. It was to ensure that the disability women were encouraged to participate. And in that first election I was held, you know, people who were not well educated to the level that we would normally say beat other people who were even more qualified than them. Yes, I've heard, I've heard that question before, yeah. that um, the election showed a surprising interest in people who were less, to be fair, qualified yeah. for the position, and that mm -hmm. is why it was wise. Yes. We had the appointment of 30% being part of that local system. Yes. So after the elections, I mean, you notice that the people were dealing with those who were with them in the community. Oh, I see. Who is value they saw. Mm -hmm. And before then, you know, there were uh, town development committees 
they were opinion leaders who were very influential. Basically, it is that one that made them elect those people. But if you want to be needed people who have technical skills, okay. <laughs> engineers, planners, accountants, people who would, in modern times, be able to guide the assembly. Mm -hmm. When they are taking a decision, they have to be guided by what is it, this decision we are making. It mm -hmm. may be popular with the people, but how do you implement it? So the idea of the 30 percent was to get, and in any case, in the past, local governments, they were always elected, but there was always appointment by the chiefs and okay. other people uh -huh. to represent them. This time round, we were looking at all the groups, all the groups that, you know, economic groups, uh, religious people, the, you know, chiefs and all the traditional authorities. You will consider them and they will bring the names. But those... <laughs> They will bring the names. The thing was lying here, standing here. Sorry. Have you got me off? No, please continue. So, they will then be there. They will then. So, the idea was to get those who were close to them to participate in the assembly sessions okay. and guide them in all this. So, and then of course, the traditional rulers also send representatives. The economic groups like GPITU, the market women, they also send representatives. So that the assembly will be representative of the various communities. The various groupings okay. expressed in a specific the community. Mm -hmm. Apart from those directly elected from the electoral areas. Did they have a phobia for party politics? Was it probably because we're coming from military period and party politics had been bastardized in the words of Kwekubaku so much and so well that that structure obviously despised party politics? Um, I can't say it is. You see, at that time, if you look at it, we had just elected a government in less than 27 months. Mm -hmm. The BNDC took over again. But preceding that, of course, you know. Uh, June 4th happened. Mm -hmm. And even though they had that and they had lifted a ban on the politics, June 4th went on as a revolutionary activity. Yeah. So with the 31st December uh, revolution, again, the idea was how do you give power to the people? Even if in the future you are talking about party politics, that was not the immediate thing. In fact, the, the PNDC's concern at that time was how they could elicit the, the guidance from people, people who were patriotic, people who were nationalistic, and whether you belong to a UP at those days or mm -hmm. CPP was not an issue. Those who were willing as patriots to come and help form the government at the center and also help in the communities there. Of course, but the wind of change was blowing from all kinds mm -hmm. of places, including the, even the uh, eastern countries. Okay. And in the West African region also, particularly in the French-speaking countries, there was a groundswell of changes. People were calling for democratic elections again. But of the PNDC's idea was to how it could get people very committed to being honest leaders ensure that the resources are uh, used for the benefit of the people. Of course, that was the original thing. And of course, introducing, having overthrown a political system, if you brought in politicians immediately, you were not sure where you would go and where you would end. I see, but politicians were at the top of it, not at the bottom. <laughs> yes. What was the difference to people anyway? <laughs> because the politicians will go to the various places to go and campaign. No, but not organized as political parties. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. If, because if you also look at that period, the PNDC era showed the highest number of and, uh, patriotic people participating, trying to help the PNDC 
and the government has done to change the situation. Really? And it, it mobilized a number of people, not in a fractious manner in which political parties would have done. Okay. And so this was a time that... So you're saying that because you didn't make it partisan, you got people who ordinarily wouldn't have been interested in partisan engagements yeah. being on board. Well, be on board. But if we're partisan, independent candidates have always sprung up one way or the other. Yes, but you see, like the, the independent candidates, they didn't have good chance of okay. winning the elections. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But right now, as I'm saying, there are people, uh, and you still find them today, who are enthusiastic. They want to help people. They want to support the community development. They support in many ways. But if you ask them to go and stand in the election, they will not contest. Professor Kwame Nensen was a member of the Constitutional and Legal Committee of the Consultative Assembly. He believes that the idea of making it non-partisan was, even though good intention at birth, it was also clearly not going to work from day one. Because the 1994 National Assembly elections showed the political parties jumped on board immediately. Well, the, that argument... You were a regional minister at the time. Yes, yes that argument you are making. The, the, no, you said, he said... He, yes, yes. Him, ...that it was not going to work. Yeah. No, the point about not non-political, mm -hmm. there are several aspects to it. First of all, these were discussions at the consultative assembly. The chiefs even today want to be part of uh, partisan politics. Yeah. But at the same time, the history we have in this country was that all chiefs who show this interest or who align with political, with political parties, parties either had difficulty with the ruling party or oh, were removed at the point. Yes. Well. Mm -hmm. And if there was a change of uh, government, they too who, I mean, those who were installed by the previous government will be removed. Apart from that, you see, when, what the emphasis should be look, looking at is that, what do you want to do for the communities? It is making sure that you send resources okay. there. And if you look at Chapter 20 of the Constitution, it is saying that we should decentralize political, administrative, and fiscal decentralization. Mm -hmm. That means sending resources and people mm -hmm. to the ground so that they will handle issues, development there, and the people who are in assemblies can hold them accountable. I see. Right. So the idea was not, if you go there, this party is in power, mm -hmm. and therefore its own uh, partisan uh, supporters come and took, take over, and you can't do anything about it. There are, that, that was the underlying cause. But if you also look at it, <coughs> if you send decent, if you send political parties to the uh, district assemblies, you know what it will mean. What it will mean is that politicians with party connections will take over. Are they not doing the same now? No. Because they say now they say they support candidates. They, they say they actively even campaign for them without coming out to say you that see, this is the, uh, that, I'm that to campaign. That argument. Yes. If you if you listen to the ground now, people will tell you mm -hmm. they know that this person may be MPP or NDC. Yeah. But they elected that person as assembly member. Yeah. They all relate to that person. And irrespective of the knowledge that the person belongs to a political party or has some support for the political party. So what would change if the person was campaigned for by his political party or put up by his political party? Yes. If, you see, what I'm saying, accountability mm -hmm. is not necessarily with political parties. That right. is also the issue. I see. And the practice we have had in this country is the fact that so long as you are well connected with the political party, you may do something wrong. People are afraid to talk about it. Are, so the point I'm making is that the argument, the fractious nature of our politics, the way people behave with politics, the ethnicity that has been introduced, the fact that the Constitution itself is 27 years today, mm -hmm. and yet we have been able to manage this thing up to this point. If you want to send power to the people, if you want development from the, for the communities, what you need to do is to resource them. 
Unfortunately, over the years, this has not been done. We have had administrative, we have the deliberative. People go and deliberate, they do the things. The assemblies go to debate. And debate. Yeah. But the resources to support that is the issue. But we envisaged a political decentralization. We en envisage some form of a financial decentralization too. Yeah. And finally, we envisage a form of decentralization mm -hmm. that would also go to make it administrative. Mm -hmm. You believe that we've done well with the administrative and the other part, the political one. What is left is the financial one. The, the resources yeah. and staffing. And if you look at the NDC, started this whole idea. During my time as minister, the manifesto said that we were to go around and consult the people of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And out of that consultation, what they wanted us to do. When I went around with the team and we did a, a survey, we discussed all the issues. None of them was talking about partisan politics. No. They wanted the resources to be sent to them. Okay. And we said, fine, we have to make sure that we enact the laws that will enable these things to happen. So we enacted laws, transferred the things. And today, when the MPP came after, in 2000, they did what we would call recentralization. Many of the things were recentralized instead of decentralized. Really? Yes, because the issues that, the, if they had continued with the, on the trend that we had started, it means that after you have set up the assemblies, posted qualified people there, moved resources, then they should be able to. That's what you did? We tried to do, okay. but we didn't uh, continue. And when we, if you look at the program that we drew up, after the consultation, mm -hmm. it had all these stages, and we wanted to decentralize education, health, and all that, so that the ordinary people, the officers, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a health worker, whether you need to account to the local assembly, you are serving them. So a district yes. diet of education, for example. Yes. But that's happening today, isn't it? That is a name. Because oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> because if you look, the two ministries that are very key in decentralization, but which are not decentralized, are education and health. They are not. They are, no, they are not. Because but, but, they, they still report vertically, and look up to the vertical directions. Oh, I see. But now, what I'm saying in effect is that if you were able to resource these people, mm -hmm. then the local people there can be the policemen about their resources, okay. how you are utilizing them. But today, if you look at but the they get stop gap measure, the stop gap measure, that's a problem. How they get come they get? We, we are in the second, I mean, we finished, we are in November. Yes. And only last two weeks that the second quarter was transferred. How much of it? It was even earlier on cap by the uh, government. What I've been saying in fact. Which has been removed <laughs> because of the case in court. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes, but the Supreme Court had to say that you can't cap what is minimally provided for in the Constitution. Yes. But more importantly, anybody who wants to advance our decentralization must be looking at how we can resource people, transfer qualified people to these places. And the qualified people will be willing to go there if they know there is, they have resources to work and they are going to do change people's lives at that point. And this is what has always been the problem. What this government has done, if you look at it, after they promised one uh, million dollars worth of CDs yeah. each year for each assembly, what have they done? Or each constituency? Yeah, they've started some projects. No, but who, what did they have they done? They've created a layer, another layer, and that is the development authorities. Mm -hmm. Grouping a number of regions and putting a, a development a, a, authority a, on them. Before the resources <laughs> will get to the district assembly, but constitutionally, you don't need development authorities. The regional coordinating council coordinates the development. But what the decentralization says that it is the district assembly yeah. that you must send the things to. And since the stopgap measure of uh, setting up the local government service, now local government service is hosting qualified people to the various districts. Uh -huh. They go there, and you should be able to give them the resources how much money, one million dollars uh, worth of CDs, if you give it to some uh, institution? That's like five point five million. Uh, yes. 
they will be able to sit, sit down and look at their priorities. But that's not what's happening. You have a layer, as I'm saying, created a bureaucratic layer. First, no matter the amount you have for them, they too have to build themselves <laughs> accommodation or something to stay yeah. in, buy a vehicles. By the time they, <laughs> even the project gets there, and more so, they, they are not even awarding the contracts. The contracts are awarded in Accra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the, the villages or the communities don't know what they want. No, the villages are part of this um, one million per constituency. At yeah. least, as explained, they went round to the various villages, asked them what they wanted, and asked the various groupings there to decide for them what ought to be done. Why? Government has priority projects in sanitation, and water provision, which is generally a problem across the country no, anyway. Uh, uh, see, the problems of uh, sanitation mm -hmm. in my constituency or district, yeah. where I was, are not the same as that of Tema. That's true. Uh -huh. Again, when they, why do they have to go from Accra or anywhere else mm -hmm. to go and consult the people? When the district assembly has a development plan, the assembly members have complained about not being given the development they promised their people. Okay. Yes. So that is what I'm saying. The, that, that recentralization. And keeping the bulk of the money in Accra, how many uh, new ministries were created? That is recentralization. Because many of the things that should have been done at the district assembly level are now being done by ministers. They, and it's all about procurement. If, if not, why should you have a ministry called Ministry of Special Initiatives procuring uh, ambulances for the health ministry? But while you have the skills in the health ministry, if you want to give them the result, even if you go to the assemblies, they will tell you their immediate needs. They, they, some of them don't even know that this project they are talking about have been done for them. Luckily, you yes. were health minister too. Yes, yes. Yes, because this is a very important matter. Yes. <laughs> the quest to make sure that the various political parties can elect candidates and put them up in various district assembly elections. If we make the DC's position elective, as we are doing in Parliament, if we also make, as we currently have, the local level, specifically the assemblyman and the unit committee are elective already. If we continue to make them partisan, how would they take away from the development plans that's currently ongoing? Um, the partisanship, you see, that's what I'm saying. You, if you elect a DC, yeah. Currently, we have 260 district assemblies. Many of them have no, they are not viable in terms of resource mobilization. Mm. Yeah. Yes. It, as internal resources. Yeah. Mobilization. And what I'm also saying is that, you see, we don't have a proper formula for how the major road development projects, like roads, mm -hmm. school, uh, schools, hospitals, will be developed. So if you elect a GCE, Opposite to the president party in any district. No, the president will not be enthusiastic to go and develop a, a tile road there so that he will take the credit. Once you have not sent the resources that I'm talking about, in the countries that these elections are done, whether even elective or a, a partisan or not, they have clear designation of taxes they collect okay. and they can keep part and send part. So the, in our the case, IGF is enough for the DC it, it, to it, work it, with? In fact, that is if the people in the center want to share blame, they will keep all the resources here. Mm -hmm. And when you are saying, they say you were elected DC, what did you do? But okay. the, and the DC is, if you elect them today in the 260, unless you change the formula of sharing resources, which a colleague of mine attempted to do by saying that they should calculate the total revenue of Ghana rather than some tax revenue. So the point I'm making is that what anybody who wants decentralization to work is to be doing is how you can encourage more people, more resources to be sent. Now we are sending qualified people who can administer contracts, can deal with all these issues. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to give power to the people, that is how you do it. It is not by electing a DCE who, if it is in the Ashanti region, is MPP, okay. DCE. And if it is NDC that is ruling, 
why will you want to what will you do to the, the, in some places professor h kwesi pempe believes that that's where the negotiation should happen <laughs> that the dc will be negotiating with central government for <laughs> some development project because the people in the constituency are primarily Ghanaians. is that not the people that you care no, about you more? See, that that is a myth. as you know it's a myth it's a myth what he is talking about these are the issues that have bothered us in the minority okay because if you want to do this Let's sit down and negotiate this. It is not to not be on pers the personal basis. Because I was elected DCE mm -hmm. for Wild West, I come and see MPP uh, minister yeah. to negotiate anything. No, it should be there. And in the regions that in countries that these things